is Joy News Prime. And tonight on Joy News Prime, with some 57 days to the December election here on your election headquarters, presidential hopefuls disqualified from contesting 2016 election, strongly considering legal options, even as they attempt to persuade the Electoral Commission to rescind its decision. The Electoral Commission, meanwhile, says it stands by its decision to disqualify the 12 presidential hopefuls and is ready to defend its decision in court. The qualified aspirants are, meanwhile, out on the campaign trail in a bid to shore up votes ahead of the election. And ahead in business, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs Emmanuel Bombandi calls on ECOWAS Commission to urgently intervene to resolve challenges faced by Ghanaian traders under the ECOWAS Brown Cast and Card Insurance Scheme during their troubles. And with less than three months to the end of the tenure, members of parliament are raising concerns about their retirement package and that of other Article 71 office holders. My name is Israel Lion. Joy News Prime is also available across Europe on ABN television as well as on BS TV and Go TV. Stay tuned. So we'll be bringing you all the politics in a bit, but we start from elsewhere. An expansion works have begun on the Tema motorway to ease traffic congestion. Meriden Port Services, the company partner in government, has begun works to add one lane to each side of the two-lane dual carriageway. According to the Minister for Roads and Highways, Inusuf Husseini, 28 million Ghana cities has been allotted for the projects and will be completed on June 16, 2017. This obviously is an interim measure. It means we are very much concerned as a ministry, as Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, as Ministry of Transport, as MPS, we are all very concerned that when the expansion of the port begins, traffic will build up here. And so to ensure that people who, con who will continuously use this road do not go through difficulties, we need to do this intervention and that's what we are doing. This one will take us six months. So whatever inconvenience that we are going to create will be six months. And then we will have the product that will substantially mitigate whatever hardship that we are facing, I mean, uh, uh, completed and handed over to us. Now, we are eternally grateful to Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority. I say Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority because it is they who found an investor to expand their ports. And in expanding the post, they anticipate an increase in cargo. And like he rightly said, in Ghana, more than 90% of our goods and services are moved by road. And so this road is a potential bottleneck. Where cargo is increased at the port, importers will want to evacuate their cargo quickly out of the port. And so they partner us to see how MPS can help in removing this potential bottleneck. Now, the chief executive of Meridian Port Services, the company partner in government to undertake phase one of the projects, Mohamed Sarah, spoke to journalists about the scope of work. We did this, the project execution and the phasing program. Tama Port is, uh, is a big port. It's the biggest and the largest port on the west coast. We are the second largest economy, and certainly we are the biggest port among all ports. So basically, the road network and the corridor is already important today, and we really need to upgrade it to match the future of Ghana and the sub-region. And for this, we have been working closely, of course, with our partners, and uh, regulate the GPHA and in close coordination with the Ministry of Roads and Highway and the team from Ghana Highway Authority and uh, the Department of Urban Roads. Basically, this is a new port development for those who did not see it. This is an existing harbor. 
and the proportion you can tell the difference. This is a massive port development. This is part of the GPHA master plan. This is actually the first step inside the GPHA master plan. The harbor basin, what you see here, we will develop four container berths, and behind it, a yard and a multi-user facility, which would also be serviced through rail. The rest of the harbor basin is open for development by GPHA in New course. This one of the bottom lane around the road, uh, along the road, is this roundabout. And this is what we want to develop. Just to give you a feel, this is the Akrata Mamoto Way. The red circle is the roundabout. And then connected to the harbor road, and as well as running parallel to the, uh, to the hospital road, and then the Meridian Road. Now, at the same event, the roads minister indicated the Kwame Nkrumah Circle Interchange is 90% complete and will be commissioned at the end of November. Join us is F.Y. Evans Jr. What's at the Kwame Nkrumah Circle Interchange to find out what's happening there? It's past 6 p.m. and contractors are still seen busily working on this part of the road. I'm here at the Kwame Nkrumah Circle Interchange and work is still ongoing. And according to engineers, work will be completed by the end of this month. That is barely three weeks away. And that also means that there's not much work left to be done around here. According to the consultants, 94% of work has been completed as of September 2016. And they were determined to hand over the project to the government by the end end of this month. Currently, the flyover from the busy internet end of the ring road to the Obechebi Lamte roundabout has been completed, while the lane marking and street lights have also been done. According to the engineers, the contractors were working beyond normal times to be able to complete the work. In less than three months from now, the current set of MPs will have their terms come to an end. As always, they would expect to be paid the end of service benefits or ex gratia, which in the past has generated considerable controversy, mainly because of the significant amounts involved. The MPs as of now cannot tell what exactly they will be getting this time around, as a five-member committee tasked by President Mahaman January this year to make recommendations for all Article 71 office holders, including the President himself and other members of the executive, is yet to announce what it's settled on. The MPs, as a result, are not very comfortable with the situation. And so on the first day, they return, they return from recess. MP for Sekendi, Papa Ousankuma, spoke to parliamentary correspondent Elton Brobe about it. The way our constitution is formulated, Article 71, it's like every four years, a president is bound by the constitution to set up such a committee who will recommend to the president in parliament to determine the emoluments, salaries, privileges, etc., etc., of certain public offices. Now, particularly for those of us within the political class, it's almost always embroiled in controversy because as we speak, the president has not determined the salaries and emoluments of that class of officers, including the chief justice, uh, members of parliament, etc., etc. But any time there's a controversy about it, it's the political class that is made responsible. And 71 who also talks about Parliament on the recommendations of that committee, determining the emoluments of the President, the Vice President, Ministers of State and Deputy Ministers. And up to now, the report has not come before Parliament. So Parliament has not been able to perform its constitutional duty under 71 2. And here we are. We are being told by the Business Committee that we're going to sit for just about three weeks. So when are we going to get a time to determine it? Will it be after the elections? And after the elections, normally, it's a perfunctory section. No serious business is done. And meanwhile, in order to determine these salaries, I believe that 
members need to have enough time to consider the report. Now, there's however some assurance coming from Majority Leader Alvin Bagbin, who says he will get government to lay the document in Parliament in time to avoid rash and suspicion. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's not yet before the business committee, so we've not been able to program it. It's not yet reversed. But we were part of the, um, the ad hoc committee that was set up, and I agree with him that a lot of work, a lot of uh, thinking, uh, went into the report and uh, I want to urge the clerk's office to complete the work and uh, pass it through the usual channels so that uh, the business committee could program it to be laid. Um, I agree with them that it's important we, we finish that work because it's going to change the nature and composition of uh, the committees. We're going to have many more committees. We're going to look at uh, the numbers at the committees. And there are a lot of re revision to these old standing orders. And so it's important that we do that for the next parliament. So Mr. Speaker, once again, I urge the clerks uh, at table to look at it and to make it available through the usual channels so that the business committee would schedule it. Meanwhile, within the next three weeks that the House is supposed to be in session, MPs will be expected to consider some key and urgent bills currently before it. For Speaker Eduardo Jaho, the limited period means Parliament cannot tolerate delays by Ministers of State in moving government business. I do hope that honourable members will give the chair and the leadership maximum cooperation and improve upon the attendance in the House so as to enable us to complete our business on time. I also urge the leadership of the majority to impress upon the ministries, departments, and agencies of government to respect the timetable of the House and prioritize legislative business and other proposals they intend to introduce for the consideration and approval. If those who are bringing their business to the House show seriousness, then the members too will also show seriousness. Let me make that point. So, Honorable Majority Leader, we have a very limited time. And my welcome address, I made that point very, very clear. The ministers who have business in this House must come to transact their business. We're watching Joy News Prime and still to come in the bulletin presidential hopefuls disqualified from contesting 2016 uh, presidential elections, cons strongly considering legal options, even as they attempt to persuade the Electoral Commission to rescind its decision. The Electoral Commission, meanwhile, says it stands by its decision to disqualify the 12 presidential hopefuls and is ready to defend its decision in court. We left, it's in the law, some have started talking with us, some have had lawyers write to us, but really, it's a matter of um, people's rights and how they want to enforce it. Not so we have all that and more coming up in the Bulletin Please stay tuned. All right, so now on to uh, election-related stories here on Joining News Prime. The flag bearer of the Progressive People's Party is refusing to accept the fact that he will not make it onto the ballot for the 2016 elections this December following his disqualification by the Electoral Commission. At a news conference on Tuesday, Dr. Papakwesi Indum pleaded with the EC to be given the chance to remedy the errors that led to his disqualification, explaining all he needs is five minutes. He has also made it clear he's prepared to go to court if his persuasion fails, alleging the Electoral Commission gave preferential treatment to some of the political parties. Maxwell Agbagba has more. The singing and chanting sums up the frustration of these PPP supporters. 
the party hierarchy was earlier locked up in a meeting at an undisclosed location. Addressing the press after the crunch meeting, Dr. Papakwisindum said the anomaly on his nomination forms was more of an administrative issue, and a five minute discussion with the Electoral Commission will resolve the matter. Dr. Indum says the party will seek legal redress if all means to resolve the impasse fails. So I'm saying to you, with all that is in this document, all that is required is a five minute discussion with the returning officer, Mrs. Charlotte Osei. And the situation will be resolved and I will be cleared to contest this December 7, 2016 election as a presidential candidate. And, and I am confident, I am confident that once I am on the ballot, I will become the next president of the Republic. I am asking the chairperson of the EC and the returning officer to let me know by the end of this week, Thursday this week, when we can meet and deal with this matter positively. Because I believe that it is a simple administrative or clerical matter that can be resolved. And we even know that someone has even been given until tomorrow to deal with the issues that he encountered. And that some other contestant was not able to pay their filing fee the stipulated time and has been cleared to contest the election. My lawyers agree that there is another option. But that option, I, Papa Kwesi Indom, do not want it. However, if we cannot solve this matter simply, administratively, then we will take the legal route and go to court to seek satisfaction so that I can be on the ballot. Earlier, some supporters trooped to the PPP head office to protest against the disqualification of their flag bearer, Dr. Papakwisi Indom. We are live here at Asalam Dan, right here at the PPP head office, where some party supporters of the PPP are dissatisfied with what the Electoral Commission came out with yesterday, disqualifying their flag bearer, Dr. Papakwisi Indom. Here at the party offices in Asalam Dan, I see an MMT bus, one fully loaded with supporters. At, in, this, in this world, Ghana, we all need jobs, not road. Yes. If you build a road for a, a good leader, or as a me, as a person, which I've been schooled before, yes. I've been paying even school fees. And if you do this thing to me, if you want me to vote for you, you are wrong. I'm, not, I'm going to vote for Bobo Syndrome for this election. So if you say you have been burning for Bobo Syndrome, it means you are lying. If you say you have, you have been getting for Bobo Syndrome, for Joy News, Maxwell Agbaba. Well, some of the 12 presidential aspirants who were disqualified from contesting in the upcoming election trip to the offices of the Electoral Commission Tuesday to explore avenues to rectify what they term as anomalies raised by the Electoral Commission about their forms. Amongst others, they accused the Electoral Commission of not giving them the opportunity to make the necessary corrections on their forms. Ma Join us as Maxwell Agbaba again was there and has come through this report. A day after their disqualification from the 2016 election, some of the disappointed presidential aspirants trooped to the head office of the Electoral Commission to have their issues resolved. Dr. Henry Lati of the Great Consolidated Popular Party, GCPP, says he prefers an amicable settlement of the matter, but he will not hesitate to seek the advice of his lawyers when that fails. These are 420 volumes, documents. And if they found something amiss, the law is for them to let us know and amend it. They don't say it. We're here from 11 o'clock to about 4 o'clock in the afternoon that day. Nobody called us. And then there was 10 more days after that. Nobody called us. And all, all, all of a sudden we hear that 18 pages, uh, 18 to 22 pages on, on the law that you quoted, and then 14 to 17 were not, were not dated. Simple things like this, that we could have done it easily. We were not um, 
told about it. And then you use that and say you, you've disqualified us. So we are here. We are waiting for our lawyer. And then we'll go and have a meeting with them so that they showed us all the forms and where the problems were and why they did not get us to um, amend it like it said in the law. Before 12 o'clock, waited till 12.30 before the uh, CPP chairman came there. Uh, there is a window in the EC constitution that when you present your document early and there is some error, close to 600 people and you are targeting three people, you understand? One of them even happened. The lady, the lady, excuse me, this lady, Amadou Babia Latifa, she happened to be my parliamentary candidate's wife. And she is a teacher. No her left to right. Not that somebody who can innocently do something. Her husband is contesting on my ticket. To the, uh, court, uh, the suit, to rather, um, you know, do that. So now they've given you four days to settle and turn wranglings within your party. If the four day, I mean, if the four day ultimatum that they've given to you elapses and you're unable to resolve the issue amicably, that, that means you're disqualified. It can't be possible before, for um, these reasons. One, I don't have power over the courts to determine when they should adjudicate on this matter and come out with their verdict. However, Madam Ikea Donko of the Ghana Freedom Party says she would not contest her disqualification. She is throwing her support behind President John Mahama. And the member there, so I must say, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Me then, yeah, me yes. No, no, me not okay. My uncle be a not just a Ghana, a Nipa. And to me, my my uncle be a me double be a me the me the ma me ba jo Mahama or me peni jo Mahama. One of the best women on the fifty other day kwe. We fly with some people come play meko. There was heavy security presence at the EC's office, but Chief Superintendent Chris Ufuri says it is part of their normal patrolling duties. I don't think we have no specific course in mind, but it is a strategic facility, and they having some form of activity here. It behooves on the police, you know, to be up and doing, you know, to patrol the area, to provide a much needed atmosphere, you know, for those who are coming and those who are working, you know, to have that sort of good working environment. For join News, Maxwell Agbaba. The chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Mua, says this qualification of the 12 presidential aspirants was an action taking based on law. Madam Charlotte Ose has been speaking at a media engagement organized by the Media Foundation for West Africa in the Northern Region. She says the EC is not aware of any intended legal suit, but is prepared if any such comes up. Which in the law, some have started talking with us, some have had lawyers write to us, but really, it's a matter of um, people's rights and how they want to enforce it. It's not for us to make that determination. We have an import, it depends on how quickly the court disposes of the case, it depends on the kind of case that comes. The candidates that their nominations were rejected, it was rejected for different grounds. So they all do not have the same kind of, um, they will not be going to court, I don't presume, in a group, it's going to be individual cases. And depending on how the judges will deal with it, we'll have to take it as it comes and we'll take a decision on that. Way. One voter cannot endorse more than one candidate. That is the law. The parliament that we all voted into parliament passed that law. We went with that law. Political parties have access to the register. The candidates want the register, they have access to the register to do their own checks. If someone wants to be president of this country and you take nomination forms that have certain legal requirements following that form, it is up to you and your own responsibility to make sure that what you submit meets the requirements of the law. Nobody appears on the register twice, so it is impossible for anyone to um, endorse someone twice. In any case, this was time for you guys to understand the reforms and the laws and the processes. If you want to focus the entire um, time with the commissioners on the disqualification process, I think that's being yourself already said. Watching Joy News Prime. We're taking a break at this point. When we come back, we'll bring you business news. But there are a lot more reactions to the disqualification of uh, the 12 presidential hopefuls this time from those who qualify. Please sit 
Right, Joe, welcome back to Joy News Prime. There's been quite a bit of reaction from the presidential hopefuls the Electoral Commission has eliminated from the 2016 presidential race, with not so much said by those left in the race. The New Patriotic Party on Tuesday issued an official position on it, and though it sympathizes with the eliminated aspirant, it doesn't quite take a position on what it feels should be done about their case. Its statement reads, we take note of the decision by the Electoral Commission to reject the nomination of 12 persons for the 2016 presidential election, inasmuch as we agree that the right things be done in the management of our elections, we express our sympathies with the candidates whose nominations have been rejected despite their efforts to meet the requirements of the law. Uh, it says, we hope that the legal process, if any, will resolve expeditiously any issues arising from the Electoral Commission's decision. And the statement is signed by Professor Mike Okwe. He's the chairperson of the MPP's Legal and uh, Constitutional Committee. So the aspect of the statement that actually speaks directly to this, it says, in as much as we agree that the right things be done in the management of our elections, we express our sympathies with the candidates whose nominations have been rejected despite their efforts to meet the requirements of the law. Now, I later, I later on caught up with the MPP Member of Parliament for Minsha South, Matthew Poku Premper, for his personal views on the disqualification. He believes it is fair for the affected aspirants to want to engage the EC, but asks that it will be unfair to those who did things right if the disqualified are reinstated. The EC claims they didn't satisfy the requirement. It's up to the aspirants to engage the EC to find out where they faulted. Shouldn't this probably have happened before the EC took that decision? It should happen within the time frame. You pick the forms, you have time to fill the forms and engage the EC. On the day that I submitted my forms, there were three mistakes in some of the seconders. And I changed them. But not when the time... Was, was it the EC that notif advised you about those uh, yes, errors? because that's what the EC does. That's what the thing. But you don't do it after. You do it during the time. You remember last time when Afrejan was disqualifying. He gave some, some of them the chance that it's two days for closure. Two days. So go and do it and bring it. But within the time frame. It is possible that the EC may have erred in arriving at this decision. So is it possible that the EC may be right? It is possible that they may so be right. So the, the, is issue they're making, the, the issue, issue they're making, the issue they're raising is that why don't we, you sit with us, let's resolve the, issue, the errors you've identified. The issue you are making is neither here nor there. It means there should be an engagement. There should be an engagement between the two bodies. And that engagement might happen by going to EC or going to use an alternative mechanism. And they can, they are, it's all available to them. What, what would the MPP have done if this happened, if their presidential aspirant had been disqualified? We would have engaged the EC. Simple. So you believe it's fair that these people are listening to and given a chance? I'm not sure if the time has lapsed and they made those mistakes. It would be fair on the other candidate who did it right to bring them back in. That is the whole point. Which one, which way do you think uh, this is going to go, the disqualification? Is it going to benefit the MPP? I can't talk about benefits. I have a manifesto to go and defend on air, and I'm going to defend my air. We, every vote counts for us, and we are going to win the hearts and souls and minds of Ghana. Do you believe that these disqualified uh, aspirants would have their votes coming your way? That's a question I'm asking. I, I don't know how the voters are going to vote till they cast their votes. I don't know. Maybe they were good. Maybe they were. I don't know. I don't know. I they may. Uh, they, they could possibly urge them to vote one way. I don't know. But still, they can urge them to vote one way. Whether as candidate or not as candidate, they are leaders. They can urge their supporters to vote anyway. Now, Tamale Central MP and coordinator of the NDC's campaign in the Northern Region, Laji Yusuf Hussein, also believes that his qualification is fair. He is, however, worried the decision could, in a way, affect the NDC negatively. But what if the President Mahama was one of those who got disqualified? That's a question I put to him as well. The only problem I have is that because it's a disqualification coming less than 60 days uh, to the elections, I, I have some apprehensions. I, I, because I do not want a situation where uh, those who have been disqualified 
will gang, gang together to contest uh, and uh, my, my president will support, will support behind the opposition candidate to contest my president. Is, is, that, is, is, is that what you believe was, is going to be the case? Why, why were the people going to contest the, the elections at all? They were going to contest because they wanted to assist my president. And so if they were going to assist my president and they have been disqualified, I feel a little apprehensive uh, in this, in this uh, direction because uh, I, I, I don't want and uh, to see a situation where uh, they will be ganging up to fight my president. Yeah, ideally, all of them would want to unseat your president, but there's some who have expressed sympathies for the NDC. You talk about somebody like uh, Ekuya Donko. Well, I'm happy about Ekuya Donko, and I've always been happy about Ekuya Donko. She has not hidden her support for uh, the president. I, well, I was a little taken aback when I heard that she was going to file, uh, because she's really supported uh, the candidature of His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, and also the presidency of John Dramani Mahama. Uh, there are one or two candidates who have shown some sympathy, some such, level of sympathy. Such as? Well, uh, if you watch, if you watch, you will know okay. that there are some Well, it's, it's fair for you to mention those ones, <laughs> yeah. apart from Ikiadon. Well, if you watch, you will, you will know that there are some candidates who have clearly shown their sympathy for uh, for us. I mean, they, they think that they are, we are doing well, and uh, but they also will want to be given the, the chance to be president of this country. Uh, but there are others, too, who have been very avid critics of the president and uh, never see anything good in the president and then so there are those that are clearly and you, and you fear that those people are likely to gang up against the NDC those people are fair-minded people any person who wants to contest for the president of this country must be a fair-minded person a person who will whose idiosyncrasies will not be cloud his judgment and so I believe that even if they don't make it after engaging with the electoral commission or going to court they will impartially assess our president who has performed creditably and probably support him to continue even, even though you feel that they're more likely to go the other way even though i feel and that is just from the an analytical point of view that anybody who was going into the president i mean into a campaign to contest for president was going to unseat my president because we have a sitting president so on that basis this appears to me to be a platform for people to coalesce to come together to fight my president. Yeah. But let's look at the grounds for their disqualification. There are those who say that the ACE has been rather unfair to these people and should have probably given them an opportunity to correct those errors that they had identified before disqualifying them. There are two, you have to look at it in two ways. Immediately your forms are accepted and you are outside the deadline for submission of forms, you do not have an automatic right to be called to, to correct the forms. It's gone. If the forms are submitted, and the days for submitting your forms are still available, you can go back, because you are within your rights, you can go back, recall your forms, and make corrections on them. Now, so, the, those whose forms have shown or manifested irregularities have, do not have an automatic right to correction because there's no longer an opportunity for them to do so. It can only happen by the magnanimity of the Electoral Commission. So, they, we ought to understand it that way. Two, the Electoral Commission has decided to exercise its powers under law to disqualify. It could have exercised these powers or this uh, in error because they could have maybe arrived at the conclusion of disqualifying these people when really the people shouldn't have been disqualified. Yes, so that is where I was coming to. Because it's an exercise founded on law in the view of the Electoral Commission. And the, the interpretation of the law could be wrong. Would you have been saying this if the NDC had been disqualified? I would have been saying more than this. I actually would have been saying more than this. I would have been briefing fire and brimstone <laughs> if my president had been disqualified. What I'm just saying is that it could so be So why don't you breathe the fire and brimstone right now? What I'm saying is that they could be wrong. So you have I've heard one of the candidates say that he will engage with the Electoral Commission. That is using the ADR to resolve the issue. And the other candidate said he will go to court. That is using the legal system to redress the issue. 
all we can say is that we are left with less than 60 days to go to elections. Whether it's ADR or using the court system, to, you will need to expedite action to resolve this matter. We're taking a break on Join News Prime. We'll bring you international news next. All right, time now for a recap of our top stories here on Join News Prime. Presidential hopefuls disqualified from contesting the 2016 election are strongly, are strongly considering their leader options, even as they attempt to pursue the Electoral Commission to rescind its decision. The Electoral Commission, meanwhile, says it stands by its decision to disqualify the 12 presidential hopefuls and is ready to defend it in court. In business, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Manov Mbande, calls on ECOWAS Commission to urgently intervene to resolve challenges faced by Ghanaian traders under the ECOWAS Brown Card Insurance Scheme during travels to and from member countries. And with less than three months to the end of their tenure, members of parliament are raising concerns about their retirement package and that of other Article 71 office holders, including the President and other members of the Executive. Now, the first budget of a Nana Ekufuado presidency will have a Zongo Development Fund. It is also not true that the MPP discriminates against people from northern Ghana. These were the words of Nana Adudanko Ekufuado when he addressed hundreds of people at Ima earlier. This forms part of the Greater Accra Tour with focus on the Ayawaso, Ayawaso constituency. Yeah, we have programs and policies for Ghanaians, particularly the Zongos. Under an Anado led administration, we are going to establish the Zongo Development Fund which will solely concentrate on developing the Zongos across the country. Now, there is this falsehood being peddled around by some political parties that the MPP discriminates against Nordness. They do this deliberately to tarnish the image of the new patriotic party. I want you to discredit that and rally behind the new patriotic party, push the elephant to the Flagstaff House come December 7. Now also on the campaign trail was the former Deputy Speaker of Parliament and the Chairman of the Constitution and Legal Affairs of uh, MPP, Professor Michael Quay, he has been reacting to the Electoral Commission's disqualification of some presidential nominees. He said it would be dangerous for the country if an injunction is secured by the agitated aspirant who want to use the legal processes to seek redress. Now, Minister of Environment, Mama Yarega, says a sub-regional decision will be required in order to guarantee the importation of low sulfur fuels into Ghana. Reports revealed that fuel imported into Ghana, mainly diesel, contained high sulfur levels, worse than the acceptable standards in the European Union and the United States of America. Although the MPA has reviewed the acceptable uh, sulfur level contained in the fuels to 10 uh, PPM, Ms. Ayaga explains that it will be more cost-effective for West African countries to import fuel with the same sulfur levels. 
A report by Swiss NGO Public Eye, in collaboration with the Africa Center for Energy Policy, revealed commodity trading firms exploited the lax regulatory standards to sell dirty diesel to African countries, including Ghana. Following this, the NPA revised the acceptable national sulfur specification for diesel from the maximum 3,000 ppm to 10 ppm. Speaking at a roundtable discussion on environmental protection at the U.S. Embassy, Environment Minister Mahama Yariga explained it will be cost-effective if all West African countries adhere to a common standard. The initiative has to be a sub-regional one. Sub-regional because we mostly lift our oil from Europe. And the tankers that lift the oil uh, are so huge that your small number of consumers in Ghana, um, relative to the size of the tank, uh, it doesn't make economic sense for them to lift just for Ghana. So if Ghana's standards are so high, and the standards in Nigeria are so low, and those in La Côte d'Ivoire low, it means we will need a separate tanker that will just lift for us and bring, okay? So the effort is also a sub-regional one yes. that, you know, we all want to have the same standard mm -hmm. so that when our suppliers are coming, they bring the same product and across the region, they supply to us. So there's a sub-regional effort to set the standards and the ECOWAS. And at the same time, we are already moving very fast and insisting on uh, those standards, but also given our refinery a reasonable time to make the investments needed to be able to meet the 10 ppm standard that we are setting for them. Addressing the issue of water quality in Ghana, a representative of U.S. and Environmental Protection Agency disclosed the U.S. government will partner Ghana to set up laboratory facilities in Accra purposely for monitoring the quality of water. Gina McCarthy is however urging government to make data on water samples available in order to build public confidence in the quality of water produced. It's monitoring and standardizing the, the lab tests themselves as well as, as uh, having third-party certifiers so that you can be sure that somebody independent is looking at that and verifying those. And then the, the, the uh, uh, EPA can then look at the certifiers. So the job is, is, is a lot easier, but there builds levels of confidence. The other thing, though, that we've found, and we'll have further discussions about this, is you need to give the public the data themselves. They want to see it. Public transparency of data is hugely important from a confidence perspective. You know, they don't want to trust government with things that are as vital as, as you know, drinking water, which, which everybody expects to have available to them, but is always cautious, even when it's made available, that it's going to be clean enough. And so we'll start working to see if there's ways in which we can help make sure that, that there's data systems to get that information out so people can see for themselves We've had to do that in the U.S., and, but it's also been a, a tremendous learning experience. Right, so we're going back onto the campaign trail. Um, President John Mahama has been out there campaigning in parts of Accra earlier today. He was at uh, Dakuman, and uh, he's been speaking about uh, some comments made by the vice presidential candidate of the New Patriotic Party, Dr. Mamadou Bauma. Let's hear the president. We are Kwampa, send a bayer, taxi drivers, the truck truck drivers, you know, Ebenya Kwampa, Afaso, Wabogana Ka. Ezu. And so, Omunim said, I repay a Wunipa home. And now, said the Nano, you call trade fair. You say, you say, you say, you say, you say, Economy no deficit na obi of Ghana. Deficit omu fi abai mu f. Nineteen percent of and now the deficit is point three percent lower than they left it. Ezu. 
Well, President Joe Mahama on the campaign trail. Now on to one other story. Uh, when Cynthia McCauley first wrote GCEO level in 1994, she failed eight out of the nine subjects, except English language, where she got a not-so-good grade six. After trying another senior high school and failing some of the subjects again, she concluded that she was not good enough to ever succeed academically. But with the encouragement of her husband, Cynthia went back to school and recently graduated with a first-class diploma in early childhood education from the University of Cape Coast and adjudged the best graduating student with a GPA of 3.95. Manasseh Azriawani went to Ujukwa in the central region to speak with Cynthia and her journey from academic failure to success. Cynthia Macaulay does gospel music, but that has not been her only dream. Her dream of succeeding academically came crashing when she completed a Palm Senior High School in 1994 and failed almost all her papers. Nine means you have failed. So almost all the subjects I had nine, that means you failed all. And it was only English, I, I had six for that I remember so well because that was the only one I could glory a little in. Cynthia Macaulay enrolled in Senior High School again but she again failed some of her papers, an experience that gave her the impression that she was not good enough to be in school. It was kind of shattered dreams, but I saw education as something that belonged to a certain class of people, that I couldn't go through education and then be any good material, that I belonged to a different group altogether. That was my mindset. Last month, however, Cynthia graduated from the University of Cape Coast with a first class diploma in early childhood education. With a grade point average of 3.95, she was adjudged the best graduating student of her department. Dr. Alex Kwao was Cynthia's supervisor at the University of Cape Coast. What I've discovered from her is she wants to achieve greater heights in life. So I happened to supervise her project to work. Uh, that was about investigating early childhood education materials. And the way she performed creditably amazed all of us. Especially looking at the research problem, at that level, the methodology she used. I mean, it was advanced work and the competency put in. Uh, it looks as if it has been a very good performance. And finally, it reflected in her final GPA, which was 3.95. And this has been one of the very good records ever since the diploma in early childhood education started. Charles Asan Ekuma first met Cynthia Macaulay 29 years ago at a Palm Senior High School where he taught physical education. The 71-year-old retired teacher says he got to know that Cynthia McCauley had a problem through his wife who sold food at the school. She had a problem financially. Yeah. She was confiding in my wife. I would say that her case is somehow artificial. An artificial problem. See that though she had to receive care never gave it fully. It was partial. And if you have that problem, obviously it will affect your thinking and all that you do. So I think that might have disturbed uh, academic work. Yes. It was serious. I wanted to really make something out of it. But unfortunately, some of the difficulties that come along with paying your school fees and the rest, I had to come home some, sometimes and then go back to school. You go back and then you're sent back home, just go for school fees. And when all hopes of academic success was dashed, Cynthia McCauley took solace in gospel music, got married and had three children. She had since been helping her husband, who is a pastor in the Victory Bible Church. She also taught in a nursery school in Cape Coast until 2014, 
when she got admission to the University of Cape Coast to pursue a diploma in early childhood education. This was her second attempt. Cynthia Macaulay says her aim is to become a university lecturer. She will apply for a degree program next academic year. It has been 22 years since she first dreamt of pursuing a degree, and her journey to what seems like her academic Canaan appears far, but with determination and the help of God, Cynthia believes everything is possible. God's word says that um, we are the first and not the last. We are, I mean, on top and not below. God expects that those who are called by his name are set on top. And I am sure that this is to write a story just for those who are standing for God.